The following video is not suited for children. Ah, welcome back to the bunker. It's been a few weeks, so I'll fill you in on the details. Had a pretty good birthday, got absolutely plastered, alone. I went outside to scavenge for food in what remains of society and I found a packet of custard creams. Uh, had a dream I was in a fist fight with Richard Beeching and Margaret Thatcher, that was fun. Uh, aside from that, I've not really had much to do. Although, tell a lie, I have found a box of DVDs that I watched as a kid. Uh, it's got the Simpsons movie, Pirates and Adventure with Scientists, all of the rings, and... Hold on. What's this? Barnyard. I don't... Remember. Let me stick it in the TV. Ah! <laughs> 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 Ooh, those are some repressed memories I didn't want back. Ah! Barnyard is a film, I think. It was made in 2006, mostly funded and produced by Nickelodeon. I couldn't find anything overly wrong with the production of this film, like Thomas or Kangaroo Jack, but I do remember it being a pretty trashy film as a kid. Now, keep in mind, we're in the post-Shrek era of animated films at this point, where adult jokes and innuendos could freely be placed into a children's movie. A lot of films were capitalising on this, and as a result we got a sudden increase in the amount of films that were aimed at families instead of just keeping it for kids, such as Ice Age, The Incredibles, Robots and Hoodwinked. My guess is that Nickelodeon Nickelodeon saw the bandwagon rolling and swiftly ran behind trying to keep up with the times. The result was Barnyard, written and directed by Steve Odek... Derek Dekrek? Der Odekrek? I've done this for like a year and I still can't pronounce these names. Writer and director of such hit films as Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, Nothing to Lose, and Kung Pao, Enter the Fist. The film was released on the big screen seemingly only in the US and Germany and received mixed but mostly negative reviews from critics and audiences alike. People mostly complained about the ugly animation and plot being tonally confused. It currently sits at about 5.5 on IMDb and 22% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I find hard to believe seeing as how it stars Kevin James, Courtney Cox, David Kochner, John DiMaggio and Sam Goddamn Elliot. The film is also also known for having more cursed images per frame than any other movie I have seen. A little fun fact pulled straight from IMDb, John Powell was offered the job of composing the music for the film. He said no for unknown reasons, and so Randy Newman was asked instead. After even he turned it down, John Debney was brought on to compose instead. That doesn't fill me with faith. Well, I guess there's only one real way to find out how messy this film really is. Let's dive in. The film opens showing a farm, with what you simple-minded viewers might think are regular animals, when in actuality, it turns out they can walk! And that's cursed image number one. We are introduced to Ben, the only character that matters because he's voiced by Sam Goddamn Elliot, who's in charge of the barnyard and is going about his daily rounds looking for someone by the name of Otis. Otis, as it turns out, is on top of a big hill about to do some surfing with his animal buddies, cursed images number two and three, consisting of pig, Mexican mouse, a cock and a ferret. And because everyone in these types of films is an idiot, they end up going down the wrong side of the cliff, which segues us into a scene with them surfing down a hill, set to some copyrighted music. Also, I'm not going to show you every cursed image I find, as that would take up about 40% of the review, so I'll just put a little counter in the top corner of the screen. Back at Tip Farm, Ben is heading a meeting when Otis crashes in tarred and feathered. Turned out that Ben is Otis's adopted dad, and the fact that he hasn't turned Otis into ground beef yet speaks volumes of his tolerance for bullshit. After an unfunny joke, the meeting is over and Ben scolds Otis for goofing around, as coyote season has just started and that he needs to grow up. Otis just acts like a jackass and tells Ben to quit worrying before goofing off even harder in a montage set to another copyrighted song. Also, that sign is written in Comic Sans. Just another thing about this film that annoys me. Cut apart! 
We get a few more minutes of nothing much, just set up for a very ham-fisted pregnant love interest and her friend, Category 4, Subcategory 1, Sassy Black Woman. After some awkward conversing, it transitions to night, where the barn turns into a full-on animal hoedown, complete with some decent puns and questionable images. Meanwhile, out on a hill, Ben is watching out for coyotes when Oat comes out to cover his shift as promised. This scene is tolerable for one reason and one reason only, listening to Sam goddamn Elliot smooth as silk cowboy voice speaking wisdom. I never thought I was going to amount to much. I certainly didn't think I'd be in charge of anything. Of course, Oatbag pulls out the whole you know how you love me thing and asks if he can go to the party, leaving old Ben alone to keep watch, with a very ominous and very foreshadowing howl in the background. Mm. Oh yeah, that's setting up something sinister right there. Back at the barn, Oatbag arrives to the sound of Boombastic, sang by none other than Biggie Cheese. Okay, no. How did this film only get 22% on Rotten Tomatoes? Biggie Cheese deserves so much better than this. What's that? Derek Adams? You think you're better than Biggie Cheese? Yeah, that's what I thought. Oh, what's that? Rich Klein? You think the characters are bland? Was Biggie Cheese bland when he saved that school bus full of children from Mothra? Yeah, you watch what you say next time. Anywho, the rest of this barn scene is just some jokes and baseline humour, nothing to write home about. Also, it establishes this couple that live close by, and it's implied later on in the film that the wife character, who keeps complaining about the party noise, is on some sort of medication. Meanwhile, Ben's still keeping watch when a naughty storm rolls in bringing with it the antagonists of the film, the coyotes as well as a dramatic shift in tone. You'd think given the tone of the film so far that these would be the types of coyote to smash themselves with a boulder, but you'd be all wrong in a bag of chips. They're actually freaky and somewhat scary looking. Also chickens have tits, I don't know why, it doesn't make sense biologically. Birds and chicken run didn't have tits, so why here? Just as the head dog is about to crack some eggs. Ben arrives to give the coyotes a good old-fashioned cowboy beatdown. Also, male cows have udders. Makes no sense. Kinda like chicken tits. Apparently the director thought it would be funny, but no one else clocked onto the joke, so now we have man-cow udders. Ben starts laying down the hurt on the coyotes, but he soon gets overwhelmed. He manages to pull back, though, and scares them off before collapsing into the mud. A chicken runs off and tells Oatbag about what happened. Otis steps out of the barn and finds Ben, who dies in his arms. We then get a quiet, sad moment that feels somewhat cheap cheapened by the inclusion of goofy looking animals walking on two legs. Still kinda sad though. I feel now is the best time to inform you that I just found out that Kevin James, who voices Otis, also plays Paul Blart, so that's what I'm going to refer to Otis as from now on. I know some of you are probably going to be all like, how did you not know that in the comments and all I have to say is, <laughs> shut up. Anyway, now that Sam Goddamn Elliot is no longer in the film, I only continue watching in the hopes that American icon and national hero, Biggie Cheese, will show up again. The animals have a meeting and decide that Paul Blart is now in charge, meaning they can do whatever they want. Blart comes back from his depression stroll to find the barn in utter confusion and tries to call it all off. The animals, however, convince him to dance by releasing an eldritch nightmare onto the stage, which they refer to as Wild Mike. Of course, the farmer comes along and sees the madness. A quick-thinking donkey knocks the poor sod out, and Paul Blart tries to make things right by making it look like a dream. The farmer buys it, and life goes on. Later that night, Blart can't be arsed doing his job, so he leaves the cock and the ferret to look after the hens while he has a quick look around the farm. Question, why hasn't the farmer done anything to stop the coyotes himself? Like it's mentioned, the farmer really cares about the animals to the point where he's vegan, but he must know about the coyotes even before they killed Ben. So why hasn't he done anything to stop them if they're clearly such a threat? Maybe he's just progressive and doesn't own a gun. Or maybe he hates animals, but instead of killing them himself, he just lets them get mauled by either wild animals or by the ferret. Maybe the farmer isn't such a nice guy after all. Maybe there's some malicious intent under that comically oversized straw hat. 
As he's doing his rounds, he bumps into the Jersey Cows. I see what you did there. As all four spot a group of boys push over a cow. Displeased that such an injustice could befall upon one of their bovine brethren, they head to the crazy lady's house and steal their car. They follow the kid, sneak into his house, and give him a cattle prod causing him to freak out. It's likely that the cows would have done something worse to the kid if Biggie Cheese hadn't written the Geneva Convention. The cows make their escape, but are tailed by the police, leading to a fun little police chase. After ditching the car and bamboozling the cops, Blart heads back to the farm, opting to keep a lookout like Ben would have instead of partying. While out on watch, he's joined by his 2D love interest, and the two share their sad backstories while gazing at the stars. It's here I'd like to address the tone of the film. It just shifts with no real warning. Like Steve-O What's-His-Name had an idea for a really heartfelt film and a really goofy, stupid animal film, and Nickelodeon was just like, why not do both? So now it just flops from sincere to stupid like a beached fish. Their emotional time is interrupted by the sound of coyotes chasing after a rabbit, and Blart goes off to give them what for. Why he didn't just let the circle of life happen is beyond me, frankly, but I guess we all make mistakes in the heat of passion, Jimbo. Then again, he does have beef with them. As you'd expect, the coyotes easily take down the Blart, and the leader says they'll head to the farm the next evening, and if Blart tries to stop them, they'll kill every animal they see. Blart, not really knowing what to do, decides he's going to leave the farm the next day. I guess nobody really cares about it because only 2D love interest tries to talk him out of it, and even then she's all like, I guess if that's what you have to do. He doesn't even tell anyone about the coyotes apart from Love Cow, so I guess he's just an asshole. As he's leaving, the cop comes out of nowhere and drags Blart behind the barn where it turns out the coyotes had just stolen some hens, and for some reason none of the animals were around to spot them, notify someone, or even try to stop them. The donkey speaks some words of advice to Blart, which causes him to do a 180 and go after the coyotes and rescue the chickens alone. He arrives at the coyote's scrapyard and demands that they hand the hens back. The coyotes obviously have him way outnumbered, but Blart stands his ground to the tune of Won't Back Down, sung by Sam Goddamn Elliot himself. I didn't think the climax to this film would actually make me feel a positive emotion, but it's hard not to feel anything when Sam Goddamn Elliot is singing in the background. As you'd expect, Paul Blart is mobbed by the coyotes and dragged to the ground. The leader calls him off and rubs in the fact that he's won some more before Blart stands up again, this time accompanied by his friends. Wacky cartoonish fighting hijinks ensue, we get a few more cursed images, and Blart kicks the coyotes' ass once and for all. On their way back to the barn, Blart finds out that his 2D love interest went into labour after he left. Blart wants to hurry on back as to not miss anything, so the group steals some motorbikes so they can do another cutaway gag of animals doing funny non-animal thing to the sound of copyrighted music. They arrive at the barn just in time to see the birth of this thing. You might say it looks like a cow, but it's capable of walking mere minutes after exiting the womb. Not even the xenomorph was that genetically advanced. Good god, these things have the power to take over the earth. And on that horrifying revelation, we end the film. So that was Barnyard. Overall opinion? Not worth watching unless you've sworn an oath to either honour Nickelodeon until you die, or just want ideas for the world's worst furry OC. The film just kind of happens, really. Not so much something you watch as more subject yourself to. The tone is all over the place, going from silly to serious when you'd least expect it. None of the main characters are likeable or have any depth. It's sometimes just flat out ugly to look at, and 10% of the frames that make up the film are just straight up cursed images. The film is just a mess, really, which is a shame because Biggie Cheese died on a cross for this film, and your sins of course, and this is all we have to remember him by? We didn't deserve Biggie Cheese, we strayed too far from his light. As I said, I feel like Steve O'Dealy had two ideas for what this film should be and tried to combine them both, leaving this tonal mess with some scenes hardly even contributing to the plot. The cow tipping and car chase scene literally holds no weight in the overall story of the film, only setting up the car to be paid off later in the scrapyard. I believe it's possible to cut this film down to 45 minutes and still have it make sense. The visual style too is just ugly. like. All the animal characters have this 
sort of weird fat look to them and all the human characters have exaggerated features to purposely make them look ugly. I get why with some characters, but it just makes the film hard to look at and when the format you're working with is primarily a visual medium, an ugly art style might not be the best choice. Then again, this is Nickelodeon we're talking about, the type of company ran by out of touch middle aged white men sat around a big desk saying stuff like, Kids love fart jokes, my son laughed at one once, or what do kids do? Pick their nose. Boogers, they're slimy, so cover everything in slime. Kids will love it, they're too stupid to know any better. That's not to say the film is lacking in talent or effort. Despite the ugly style, there are still some shots in the film that are decently made and it's clear that some voice actors put the work into their performance despite having flat or annoying characters. Sam goddamn Elliot is the only reason this film is worth watching for me, and as such I'm giving the goodest boy award to Ben. Uh, so now I thank the Lord Biggie Cheezus that this film is over, and subsequently this review. I got a total of 25 cursed images from this film, some more cursed than others, but cursed nonetheless. If you think you can get more cursed images out of this film, please let me know and send them to me either by Twitter or by email. For now though, I bid thee fair tidings and safe travel. Remember to do the like and subscribe thing, and roll the outro! <laughs>